episode 47. Let's do this. This is the business of architecture. Helping architects conquer the world. And here's your host, Enoch Sears. Welcome back, Architect Nation. This is your host, Enoch Bartlett Sears, and this is the show where we talk about the business of architecture, where we talk about how to run a better business so you can focus your energies on making great design. And today we're going to be talking with someone who has made that the focus of his career, helping architects and design professionals run better businesses so they can create great design. And I'd like to welcome today Bob Fisher. He's a principal with Greenway Group. He's also the associate publisher of Design Intelligence, which many of you may be familiar with. So, Bob, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me, Nick. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I really appreciate the fact that you reached out to me and, and basically asked me if you could join us on the show, and I thought it was a great fit. We've talked before, and I'm really excited to tell our audience about what you do. So maybe, Bob, if you could just start out just telling us Tell us what you do on a daily basis, kind of what your job and what your what Greenway Group does. Great. Well, there are really three parts to our enterprise. Uh, the first is Greenway Group, and that is a management consulting firm that works with architecture and other design-based uh, organizations, including educational institutions and professional associations like the AIA. Uh, we also work with uh, building product manufacturers, a few engineering firms, and, and that sort of thing, uh, really on all components of their business. Uh, it could be something uh, primarily financial, like ownership transition. It could be uh, helping them develop a business strategy, a marketing plan, uh, some other aspect of operations. Uh, we're sort of gener anything that falls under the, the realm of management consulting. So the second component to what we do uh, is a think tank we convene called the Design Futures Council. And the Design Futures Council is a multidisciplinary group. It's made up of various uh, industry leaders that get together periodically, uh, two times a year here in the States, and then we have a few different uh, international events each year. And people get together to talk about how the overall environment is changing for uh, built environment design professionals and how people need to adjust what they do in order to thrive in this changing environment. And so the, the third component to our business is actually the journal of the Design Futures Council, and it's called Design Intelligence. And it's really our research and thought leadership and publishing arm. So I, I wear a lot of hats. My, uh, my daily schedule looks a little bit, uh, looks a little bit kooky. Yeah. Can you give me an example of just a daily schedule for you and kind of the activities you do as a principal of Greenway Group? Sure. So in one day, I may spend some time working on a strategic plan for um, an educational institution, a college of architecture and design. Then I might toggle over to working for working on a communications and brand strategy for a firm. Then I might uh, wind up turning around and, and writing an article uh, on uh, international practice uh, for design intelligence and doing research that, uh, that helps me accomplish that kind of thing. So it's really great for somebody like me who, uh, who really likes to do a lot of different things. So there's, there's certainly no shortage of uh, fun things to do. And uh, a lot of different areas are ways that we try to help. Okay. Now, Bob, we talked earlier also that you're not uh, a specialist, as it might be, that you actually have multifaceted sort of skill set that, and tell us a little bit about your background, because I, I thought your your background was pretty interesting. Well, my background, I have a pretty curvy career path. So I actually started out um, at the beginning of my career in visual communications design. So I worked as a graphic designer doing corporate communications and eventually um, became an art director for Cartoon Network and worked in the entertainment industry that way, uh, wound up launching my own uh, brand communications firm. Uh, then I also worked uh, as the director of communications for an independent Catholic school. So I was in charge of the, uh, that, that sort of broadened my role uh, considerably. And in the meantime, I went and picked up a, uh, a master's degree in business from Georgia State University. 
So I, I kind of moved from a tactical communications role into a broader communication strategy role and then eventually into a, a business strategy role here. The common themes uh, being, of course, design, communication, and business. And now I've found a place where I can bring all of those things together uh, to help practices or to help pr professional areas the design disciplines that I care tremendously about. So it's really, uh, it's really a rewarding, uh, it's been a kind of a rewarding path that way. How did you come to work at Greenway Group? Well, I, I like to say that I was drafted uh, because what happened is, is when I was the uh, director of communications for the school, um, you know, I was always, I was involved with a lot of different design organizations um, for a variety of different reasons. Uh, you know, I was doing, uh, I was planning all the communications for our uh, strategic plan, the campus master plan, and the capital campaign to support that campus master plan, and uh, working with a lot of different design organizations to make that happen, architecture firms and, and uh, communications firms and things like that. Well, I started being asked by uh, small firms and solo professionals for business advice in running their practices. So, you know, I, I took on a couple of, uh, I took on a couple of freelance clients with the blessings of my uh, bosses at the time and uh, took a few small firms through, uh, through growth plans, basically through developing business plans and just was really encouraged uh, to see what kind of results they got uh, far ahead of the schedule that even I anticipated. So, what I started to do was I started to to craft a business plan for a practice that would that would continue to do this for uh, a variety of different design disciplines. So interiors, you know, interiors firms, industrial design firms, architecture firms, uh, brand design firms, what have you. Uh, and I I through that process and researching that business plan, I met Jim Kramer, who is the uh, founder of Greenway Group. He founded it 20 years ago. Uh, after a stint as the CEO of the AIA. And uh, it just immediately made sense for us to kind of join forces and for me to, uh, to do my work here uh, in lieu of basically starting a competing practice. Makes perfect sense. So yeah. tell me about those, those days when you were making that transition and you were preparing mm -hmm. these business plans. Tell me about that process. How, does, how did that start when you sat down and, got, and launched that? Take me through that. Well, it was really... Um, it was really something that was just so much fun and it was so incredibly rewarding because what happened is, is I saw people who were great practitioners of whatever design discipline they were in. When they, when they turned their attention and their creativity to planning and essentially designing their business, designing their practice, instead of just, you know, designing through their practice, um, you know, you see people get, uh, get really inspired and you see people get excited about their future and you see people start to achieve real results, uh, you know, uh, real financial results. One of my first clients, uh, you know, by October of the first year that we were working together had already hit all of their yearly financial goals. They had been looking to reposition their business and within three months, 70% uh, of their client list had migrated over to their, uh, to their desired target market and they were just so excited about it and that kind of it, uh, con that kind of excitement enthusiasm was really contagious and so I found that I had a hard time not working on it I mean it was just uh, I really felt like I was helping people uh, to to make a living doing what they love to do and to make a living doing something that helped so many other people. So it was, it was kind of a no brainer. Yeah. So if you're sitting down with a, a sole practitioner or a, a small firm owner, what are the steps that you take them through? Take me sort of through from A to Z, if you will, uh, the steps to put this into place and kind of where you start and then where you like to end up. Well, it depends. Uh, all of it depends on their situation. So when you're talking about uh, helping somebody develop their practice, people are going to be at all different experience and knowledge levels and they're going to be at different life cycles of their firm. So it's different if you got somebody who's going out on their own for the first time and they're launching a solo practice than it is going to be um, helping somebody who's had a 
moderately successful practice for say 10 or 15 years who wants to grow it and needs a plan to do that. So the first step kind of in general, it, it really mirrors the design process, right? So if you look at the design process, irrespective of what discipline it's in, it starts with research. You know, you've got to know what problem you're trying to solve. And then you get into um, kind of a, a concepting phase. You get into an... A, a how, how, might someone, how might someone do the research? Let's okay, well... On that. Okay, so let's we'll start with that. And it gives a um, let's say a hypothetical example just to make it more more tangible because obviously there's going like you said it it depends. Right. So let's say that somebody wants to start a business. Let's say that you've got somebody that has six, seven, eight years um, with a mid-sized firm and they want to launch their own architecture practice. Excellent, right? loving it. Okay, so it's a little bit easier if the person was already practicing in a certain kind of specialty and they want to do something to build on that experience. It's a little bit more challenging if you've got somebody who, let's say they've been doing corporate and retail and they want to jump over into, you know, residential. Um, that's, they're, they're, those are two different paths, right? So let's say that somebody wants to, to launch their own firm. The first thing that they need to do, um, is they need to they need to figure out, or, or I should say they need to change how they look at themselves, because a lot of people make the mistake of um, you know they're in practice and they they basically go out to to hang out their own shingle right as opposed to going out and trying to fill a need that is there in the market. So in other areas, right, in other types of businesses, entrepreneurs might look at the market and they might identify a need that's there, you know, some group that's not being served, some way that things are not being done, and design some kind of service to fill that need. When you have, uh, you know, when you have professional services people, a lot of times they, they're practitioners and they say, well, I want to go out on my own. So they, they go out in an undifferentiated way into a crowded market and the only way that they can grow unless the market's growing is to to basically steal business from more entrenched competitors which is really hard to do unless you are highly differentiated and well positioned to to communicate that so I don't know if I'm answering your question um, uh, or maybe I'm answering your question in kind of a roundabout way but the first thing that people need to do is they need to go out and get a sense of what the potential market is for them. So if you're if you're going out and you're wanting to start a generalist practice, uh, you're going to have your first challenge is going to be getting information on that because uh, there are so many different types of projects. There are so many different types of clients that without focusing in uh, and having some kind of specialty, uh, it's going to be hard to get a picture of what this market looks like. But if you do want to, to choose a, a kind of specialty, let's say you want to um, let's say you want to develop a retail design firm. Well, the first thing to do is to figure out who are your likely clients. There are clients that have of many different sizes and many different compositions. Chances are you're not going to go out and immediately start designing things for Target. You're going to have to start with smaller retailers. If you've practiced before in that area and you have, um, let's say you have deep knowledge in a particular segment of the retail business, that'll help too. Because you'll have demonstrated expertise that's kind of backed up by, um, by the knowledge that you've accumulated and also the portfolio that you have to show. Uh, that you can, you can go out there and say, hey, nobody knows better how to do clothing retail stores, right? Or you could specialize, um, you know, and if you're specializing in something like that, which is a, a vertical, you know, there's two different ways you can kind of specialize, right? Vertical or horizontal. So if your audience isn't familiar with that, a vertical specialty is when you specialize in serving one particular industry. A horizontal specialty in really rough terms is specializing in serving a lot of different types of industries, but doing one particular thing, right? So one question that people might want to ask themselves is, do I want to specialize or don't I? And understand what the kind of ramifications of that decision are. And the next thing is, okay, if I want to specialize, 
how do I want to specialize? Do I want to be a vertical specialist and be the best healthcare architect out there? Or do I want to, you know, specialize horizontally and do one particular thing very, very well for clients in a variety of different industries? So once you get to that level, uh, the next thing to do is to start to put together the fundamentals of a business plan. All right. Excellent. So, do you have any Do you have any pointers or um, tips for choosing a vertical versus a horizontal? Because obviously, there's going to be some people might just feel, well, there's so many options out there. You know, mm -hmm. how do I kind of pick on one that I want to do? Well, it's a that's a really interesting question, and it's kind of a tough question for people to answer. I've um, I, there's there's one writer named Blair Enns who talks about this as the difficult business decision, you know, because you're you you have to make this courageous decision of not only who to specialize in serving, but who do you know what business do you turn away because it's not really serving you, the the core of your practice. So a couple of different things to look at when you're choosing a specialty. The first is it really comes down to knowledge and passion, right? What uh, what do you know uh, that's going to give you an advantage over other um, other choices that a client might have, uh, uh, you know, other firms basically, and other practitioners? And the other is, is what do you really feel passionate about? So earlier I talked about one of my early clients in uh, graphic design and communications. Uh, they wanted to, they wanted, it was a husband and wife uh, owned firm. Uh, family business, and they wanted to change their firm's focus to serving primarily nonprofits and education, because that's that that's where their passions were. You know, that's what they felt strongly about. That's what they wanted their life's work to be, uh, to helping nonprofits thrive. Right. So that was kind of an easy one uh, because they were so driven by by this strong interest and the strong belief in what they did that they were willing to throw themselves into it wholeheartedly and and really focus and it worked out very well for them excellent yeah so and when yeah. when you were doing this this freelancing so to speak at your mm -hmm. previous position where you started to develop some business plans can you give me an example of and maybe it doesn't have to be specific but the vertical someone might have chosen or the horizontal someone might have chosen and how that influenced the eventual success of that plan. Right. So, you know, one example of uh, a commonly chosen horizontal might be uh, corporate interiors, right? So you can do corporate interiors work for a technology firm. You can do corporate interiors work uh, for a financial services company. You can do corporate interiors work for any kind of business, right? But you're you're focused on that. And if you've got, let's say, you know a whole lot about workplace design, right? And you know a whole lot about how uh, design of the built environment can increase productivity and efficiency and help promote the, promote the kind of culture that a client organization wants, you might want to consider that kind of horizontal specialty, right? So a vertical specialty, uh, you know, the retail example is another really good one. Um, and this is where you see a lot of firms that are actually multidisciplinary firms. They'll do, um, they'll do everything from the built environment design uh, for a retail outfit all the way down to uh, the graphic design, the signage, the graphic identity, the communications and marketing that sort of thing. That would be an example of providing um, a whole host of services for one very specific vertical. Now, you could even subspecialize inside that vertical. We used the example earlier of uh, clothing retail, but that's not necessary. It just depends on uh, a combination of what your expertise and what your passion is. Sure. Excellent. So that first step would be the research. We're choosing our, we're choosing our vertical and then Take me quickly through the, the rest of the steps of this business plan. Sure. Well, there are actually a few other uh, steps that you need to take in terms of the, the research, right? Oh, let's not skip so, over that. Yeah, please. Yeah. Well, one of the things that, uh, that people fail to do is to be fully aware of what other choices their potential clients have. So it's basically it's a competitor analysis. So you have to get an idea of, 
And this is a, something that these days is very easy to do because uh, everybody has a web presence, right? So if you're, let's say you, uh, you decide that you, your most likely clients are going to come within, you know, 50 miles of wherever your first office is, right? So you set out what those parameters are. And you take a look at the other firms and the other sole practitioners that might be uh, potential competitors, and you see how they're positioning themselves, right? What are they saying about themselves to try to attract the right kind of clients? Are they totally undifferentiated general practitioners? Are they people who have really sharp, nicely honed messages that let potential clients know exactly uh, whether or not that firm is for them? So, you know, it's good to, it's good to get an idea of uh, not just how many competitors or how many alternate choices, um, you know, your, your potential clients are going to have, but who they are. Get to know those firms, right, as much as you can so that you know who, um, who you're going to be competing against for the attention of, uh, of potential clients. Excellent. Well, I really like the, the, the thing that you said a little while, a little ways back about looking at it like an entrepreneur instead of going out there and saying, okay, I have these services, I'm going to go out there and, and serve the market, actually researching a specific need. I mean, a light bulb went off in my head and I hopefully it did for others as well. And then you talked about the next step would be competitive analysis. What other aspects of the research, Bob, because I know that's just so important. Right. Well, you've got to figure out how people are making this purchasing decision, right? So any built environment designer is going to be facing a pretty complex purchasing decision. People usually take a long time to think about it because the upfront costs are, are considerable for the client, right? So it's important to understand uh, what kind of business development environment you're going to be entering. And that helps you figure out how to best communicate with people. So business development is really nothing more than an education process, right? You go from somebody not knowing who you are all the way up through an education process where you're, you're letting them know how it is you can help them, how it is you can have a positive effect on their situation up to the point where they know you, they prefer you, and then ultimately they choose you and they hire you, right? So understanding what it is that your market needs is really essential to being able to design in that process. Do you have any suggestions for how, how to find that out on a tactical level? Yeah, I mean, one way to do it is if you have any contacts among clients, right, uh, uh, personal relationships that are, that are good enough that you can actually go and talk to people, that's one of the most effective ways that you can do it. Um, so a lot of people will be coming into these situations having some experience with that. You know, if you've got somebody who, um, who had gotten to the point where they had business development responsibility in their firm, they're going to have some idea. Uh, they're going to have a lot of client contact. They're going to have some idea of what it is that people are after, and they can design an offering um, to help accommodate that. Excellent. So where do we go from there? Anything else about the research phase, Bob, that you feel is essential to talk about? Yeah, it never ends. So <laughs> basically, um, you can never know enough about your market, and you should always you know, once you have kind of a research program in place, right, where you're, you're in the habit of collecting uh, information on who your ideal clients are and what it is that they need and who your potential co competitors are, you should continually refresh that, right, a, f a few times a year just to keep up on what changes are out there in the marketplace. Because the last thing that you want to do is design a business model around delivering um, a service that fills a need that goes away, right? Um, there are plenty of there are plenty of businesses that um, uh, there there are very few hand drafts people around there anymore, you know. And people who designed a uh, designed careers around that or designed businesses around that, uh, they are they are quickly going away, if not already gone. So what you want to do is is you want to keep this this process of research going so it's a continual kind of investigation and renewal. Excellent. So we do our research, we stay up on it, we make sure that we're continually finding out the needs of our users and what are the what are the other steps then in, in a growth plan? 
So then you need to figure out once you once you have kind of the lay of the land that way, and you understand what the what the what the landscape, the overall ban- business landscape looks like. Um, and there are other things to look at too, like what are you know um, how much do people spend on these kind of things? I mean, you you have to do research on specifically what kind of uh, projects you're gonna you're gonna go after. But a lot of people already know that from uh, from prior experience. So once you do that, you have to figure out well how am I going to approach this market, right? Uh, one of the hardest things to do is to just jump in there and say okay I want to start. Uh, you know, I want to start designing um, high-end custom homes. Well, it's great that you know that, but one of the problems there is there are a lot of people out there who are already designing high-end custom homes. What is it that? What is it about how you're going to approach this market, or what it is you're going to offer that's going to be different, right? And thinking through that very thoroughly, right? So thinking through a differentiator, what makes your practice different than other options that clients have, and positioning, how you're going to, literally, how you're going to place your firm in the minds of prospects relative to all of your competition. Those two things are absolutely essential parts of an overall marketing plan. So other parts of your marketing plan that you need to work out ahead of time is you need to know... um, you need to give yourself some revenue goals. Uh, you need to figure out how much money you need in order to sustain and grow the business, and you need to know um, how much you know how that's going to translate into number of projects, number of clients, types of clients and projects that you're going to chase after, so that you're not just running out there uh, trying to grab whatever business comes your way. Um, although there's probably some of that that's that's necessary at the beginning just to kind of get cash flow going but uh, but you're you're able to approach things in a highly targeted way and when you know all of those different things uh, you can put together a, a a proactive business development plan where you are gaining more control over the future of your firm by choosing what kind of clients you want to work with and giving them a really compelling reason to choose you versus other options that they have. Okay. Talk to me a little bit about positioning, Bob. And there's a great article that I'm going to put a link to that you wrote that talks a little bit about that. Well, positioning is one of the key elements uh, that we work, you know, we work with people uh, on this all the time. And it's, it's an issue that's important regardless of whether you're a sole practitioner or whether you have a firm of a thousand people. Uh, and what, what kind of firms do you work with? Just give our audience a general idea. There's well, we work out there. With, okay, well, we work with uh, firms of a variety of different sizes. Um, you know, we'll work with firms that are on the larger end, like an HOK or an SOM, uh, all the way on down through uh, midsize and regional firms. Um, uh, on down to uh, smaller practitioners. I think our, our, uh, our one of our smaller clients right now is a five-person interiors practice based in Nantucket. So uh, most of our business comes you know, through uh, designers for the built environment, whether they're interiors, architecture, A&E firms, uh, or you know, some hybrid firm. Uh, but we've got, you know, we work with folks on a, a, a whole variety of different scales and situations. Okay. So anyway, your original question, I think, though, had to do with something with positioning, right? It did. Thank you. And yeah. Yeah. So so basically, uh, like I said before, positioning is really deciding what image or what place uh, in a prospect's mind do you want to reserve for your firm? One of the toughest things to do is to go out there without any kind of differentiation or any kind of position because the if if somebody isn't going to choose you based on some special aspect of your offering maybe it's deep expertise in one kind of one area of practice right all they've got to go on is basically uh, relationship and price so relationship that's another thing that's really important regardless of what size the size the firm is but uh, but positioning is something that uh, that is very important because nobody, especially um, 
when they're launching a practice or when they're a smaller practice, nobody has time to devote solely to one thing. I mean, you're going to have to wear a lot of different hats, right? You're going to have to be getting the work. You're going to have to be doing the work and you're going to have to be, you know, managing the client relationships and, and managing the delivery process and, and all of that sort of stuff. So positioning, having a firm that's well positioned, right, and communicating well about that lets the market know that you're out there as a really compelling option um, before you engage them on a personal level and start spending your personal time to, uh, to help usher people through that, through that education process that we talked about before, from when they don't know you all the way you know, up into when they've chosen you and when they've, when they've commissioned you for something. So the idea of marketing uh, in, a, in a business development sense is it lets people know who you are and lets people know what you offer and gives people a really, um, again, I keep using this word compelling reason uh, to contact you and uh, to find out more and to put themselves on that, that kind of educational process. Are there any common ways that you're seeing architecture firms in the smaller ranges, because that's primarily our audience, that they're doing their business development in terms of modalities? How are they going out there when they want to do business development? Sure. Well, the encouraging thing is that we see, uh, you know, that we see more and more sophistication in firms of all sizes and and how to do this. You know, it uh, traditionally practitioners don't usually, you know, sometimes practitioners don't like to see themselves as business people. They don't like to see themselves as marketers and they don't like to see themselves as salespeople. And really, you know, all of the, um, one of the things that we try to get people past is the idea that there's this dichotomy. It's a false dichotomy between uh, professional practice and, and business. You can design your practice the same way that you design projects for clients. It's not something that needs to be foreign or alien. And getting out there and doing dis- business development isn't about um, strong arming some reluctant prospect into buying something from you. What it really is, is it's about sharing the fantastic positive impact that you can have through your work uh, on a client on a client's organization or if it's residential on their on their personal life so you know changing that approach or changing that way of looking at business development is one of the one of the key things to start and that that allows people to be as passionate about promoting their business as they are about the design work that they do. And that's really key. When you've got somebody who's absolutely convinced of the value that they can give uh, to, to a client, it makes it uh, exciting for the prospect um, to, to hear about that. And it makes it a lot more palatable for the practitioner to talk about it. Excellent. Well, for people that want to find more resources about the things we've talked about today, Bob, what are some, what are some places where you can send them? Well, um, at the risk of sounding like I'm, you know, plugging our own organization, one place that uh, that they can go is uh, Design Intelligence has a lot of resources online, uh, different thought leadership pieces, and that's at di.net. We also have a, you can sign up for a um, for a free electronic newsletter that we uh, that we put out a couple times a month. Um, there are some other great books and resources out there uh, in terms of firm management. Um, Jim Kramer, the founder of our firm, uh, with uh, Scott Simpson of Kling Stubbins, uh, co-wrote uh, a book called uh, How Firms Succeed. And that's a great kind of soup to nuts um, uh, guide on, uh, on operating a, uh, a successful architecture firm. Uh, there are a whole bunch of different you know, if you get into different areas of um, uh, areas of specialty, uh, like if you want to talk about uh, brand, as an example, um, Marty Neumeyer wrote a fantastic book called The Brand Gap. And um, one of the things that we can do is uh, if you do uh, show notes, uh, I can send you some resources for the listeners uh, and we can put together um, a whole bunch of different uh, books. And of course, there's podcasts like yours. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's, that's a fantastic resource for people. 
uh, and they shouldn't limit themselves, obviously, to the idea of books. Um, but the, hopefully that gives you kind of a start, and we can, uh, we can do some follow-up with, uh, with some more depth on that. The other thing is um, sometimes people undervalue uh, professional associations, and I know that, uh, uh, and again, I'm not necessarily looking to plug AIA, but I know that they have some fantastic resources out there for firms of all different sizes and uh, a lot of knowledge support. Uh, there, um, uh, ASID, IIDA, uh, they're, they're fantastic as well, and uh, potential sources of support and resources too. Excellent. Well, thanks, Bob. I appreciate it. Thanks for being on the Business of Architecture show. Thank you. And that's a wrap. Thanks for riding along on another show about the business of architecture. I want to know your opinion about today's episode. Visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash podcast or send me an email at show at businessofarchitecture.com with your feedback about today's show. And remember, visit businessofarchitecture.com forward slash free to grab your free membership pass to Business of Architecture Insider, where you'll have first access to free resources to help you run a great business. See you next week. views expressed on the show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you run a great business. Bump music credit to Ben Folds 5. Do it anyway.